So there's a piano back here. Does anyone know how to play piano? Because I need someone to like music me onto the stage. We're gonna do that whole thing over again. No? Okay. Hi there, thank you for coming. Uh, so the sign reads, Responsibility, Nuremberg, and Krishna. And you're in the right place if that's what you wanted to see. But I changed the title of the talk, as I usually do, right before I give it. Uh, as Jamie mentioned, in my previous talk on software ethics, I shared a story about how I built software to find Wi-Fi hotspots by looking at how their signal strength changed as my phone moved around. But what I didn't know was that the real use for the software was not to find Wi-Fi hotspots, but people. Its purpose was to help soldiers with guns find people by tracking signals broadcast by their phones. I built this at the same time that we found out that the military had been spying on Americans in America with drones. So even if I was okay with them helping, helping them find people, which I wasn't in the first place, I'm certainly not okay with them helping, with helping them find US citizens in the country that I live in. Now, I don't know if it was ever actually used. I was an intern without a security clearance, and so in all likelihood, everything that I was working on was just put into a drawer somewhere and forgotten about. But the chance that it helped to murder people weighs on me heavily, and it probably always will. But today I want to talk to you about someone who did something far worse, and about his struggle for the remainder of his life to mitigate the negative consequences of his actions. I want to talk to you about the father of the atomic bomb, J. Robert Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer's early life helped shape much of his work on the Manhattan Project, the code name for the US program to develop the technology for the atomic bomb in the early and mid-1940s. His early education took place at the Ethical Culture Society. Ethical culture is a movement founded by a rabbi who believed in the need for a religion without the trappings of ritual and creed that united all mankind in moral and social action. Oppenheimer's father had moved to America penniless, with no higher education, and without speaking English. He had gotten a job at a textiles company and worked his way up to an executive role over a decade. And now he was a wealthy man living in Manhattan with a sizable art collection. He'd been a member of the Ethical Culture Society for many years and was involved with the school as well. The younger Oppenheimer was a versatile scholar. He was interested in English and French literature and especially in mineralogy. He wrote to various mineralogists as a young boy. Unaware of his age, one of these correspondents nominated Robert for a membership in and to give a lecture for a mineralog mineralogical club in New York. Robert was terrified to give a presentation to adults. I can relate. And begged his father to explain that they'd invited a 12-year-old. His father was greatly amused and encouraged his son to accept the honor. Robert showed up and startled the audience of geologists who laughed out loud. <laughs> he took the stage and they placed a wooden box below the podium so that he could stand and be seen. Nonetheless, he read his prepared remarks and received a hearty round of applause. This interest in and adeptness at a broad range of topics would be a consistent theme throughout Oppenheimer's life. He would read and write poetry, study languages, philosophy, and religions. Oppenheimer was a genius when it came to understanding theories and concepts. But he was a clumsy and inept scientist when it came to the meticulous work involved in laboratory physics. In his postgraduate studies at Cambridge in 1929, Oppenheimer had a severe mental break. His good friend from the Ethical Culture School, Francis Ferguson, noted in his journal that Oppenheimer had a first class case of depression. While there's no reliable or detailed account of this, Robert claimed to have left a poisoned apple on the desk of his tutor at Cambridge, Patrick Blackett, who's here on the screen. Though Oppenheimer liked Blackett, his tutor was a hands-on experimental physicist who was everything that Robert wasn't, and he pressured Robert to become better by doing the things that he wasn't very good at. This caused Oppenheimer's already intense anxiety to increase, and it culminated in Robert poisoning this apple and leaving it on the physicist's desk. Whether Blackett detected the poison or if it wasn't so much a poison as like a laxative or just something to make him sick, or maybe even this apple was an imaginary thing that Robert had just invented in his mind, we don't really know. But we do know that Blackett was not actually injured. 
despite that it was a very serious matter and it was grounds for expulsion from Cambridge. His parents, who were visiting due to Robert's emotional state, lobbied the university not to press charges or expel him on condition that Robert see a psychiatrist. Robert was later diagnosed with dementia praecox, which is an archaic term for symptoms we now know as uh, schizophrenia. Bouts of depression and self-destructive tendencies would follow Robert for the rest of his life, though nothing quite as serious as this one. He said in a letter to his brother Frank Oppenheimer years later that I can't think that it would be terrible of me to say, and it is occasionally true, that I need physics more than friends. Until about 1934, after his postgraduate studies, and he had become a professor splitting time at Berkeley and Caltech, Oppenheimer displayed little interest in politics. It was Adolf Hitler's rise to power in the previous year that would begin to intrude on Robert's carefully cultivated self-image of an inworldly, withdrawn, unesthetic person who didn't know what was going on. In the spring of 1934, Oppenheimer agreed to earmark 3% of his annual salary, which amounted to roughly $100, for two years to the cause of supporting German physicists attempting to immigrate from Germany to the United States. He would later invite some of his students to attend a longshoreman's rally. They sat high in a balcony, recalled one of the students, and they were caught up in the enthusiasm, shouting, strike, strike, strike. Oppenheimer met a woman named Jean Tatlock in the spring of 1936. She was a complicated woman, certain to hold the interest of a physicist with an acute sense of the psychological. She would also become Oppenheimer's truest love, as a friend would later describe her. And she would continue with an affair, he would continue with an, a, an affair with her even after he married his wife years later. And so perhaps it's only natural that Jean's activism and social conscience were awakened in Robert the sense of social responsibility that had been so often discussed at the Ethical Culture School. It was Jean who opened the door of, for Robert into the world of politics. Over the next few years, Oppenheimer would become progressively more interested in left-leaning politics and became especially enamored with the communist ideas coming out of the USSR. He would donate to causes such as the Spanish Revolution in cash and through communist front organizations, and he would continue his involvement with unions, including joining the teachers' union, and attend and host gatherings where politics were discussed. Though he would completely and voluntarily cut off these associations before joining the Manhattan Project, and he was never, never a formal member, dues-paying member of the Communist Party, these associations and his status as a fellow traveler would come up again and again as his enemies tried to strip him of his political power or prevent him from being involved with the bomb projects. His communist leanings in the 30s did not stop Oppenheimer from wanting to help his country when, with his knowledge of physics when the war effort required it. He told his friend Arthur Compton that I'm cutting off every communist connection, for if I don't, the government will find it difficult to use me, and I don't want to let anything interfere with my usefulness to the nation. By September of 1942, Oppenheimer's name was being floated as a candidate to direct a secret weapons lab that would be founded to coordinate the efforts around the country on the development of an atomic bomb. After meeting General Leslie Grove, the military commander of the Manhattan Engineer District, which is better known as the Manhattan Project, Oppenheimer left Groves with his impression of a real genius who knew about everything. Oppenheimer was the first scientist Groves had met that grasped that building an atomic bomb required finding practical solutions to a variety of cross-disciplinary problems. He proposed centralizing the efforts at Princeton, Chicago, and Berkeley into one location where they could begin to come to grips with the chemical, metallurgical, engineering, and ordnance problem that had so far received no consideration at all. Groves proposed Oppenheimer as director of the Manhattan Project, and he, immediately after his appointment, Oppenheimer began to court key figures in the scientific community. In addition to recruiting many of his graduate students, he recruited notable scientists such as Hans Beth, David Bohm, and Richard Feynman. But at the same time, he had close friends turning him down on ethical grounds. One of his closest friends, Isidore Rabbi, later said that I was strongly opposed to the bombing ever since 1931, when I saw those pictures of the Japanese bombing that suburb of Shanghai. You drop a bomb and it, feels, it falls on the just and unjust. There's no escape from it. The prudent man can't escape, nor the honest man. During the war in the Germany, we certainly helped to develop devices for bombing, but this was a real enemy and a serious matter. But the atomic bombing just carried the principle one step further, and I didn't like it then, and I don't like it now. 
I think it's terrible. Something similar happened this past summer when Salesforce and Google employees separately wrote letters to their respective companies to re-examine their relationships with Customs and Border Protection and the Department of Defense, respectively. These employees stood up for what they felt was ethical, but they worked within the system to try and make a change, and it worked. Oppenheimer was motivated by American patriotism, hatred of the Jews, I'm sorry, hatred of the, <laughs> hatement of Germany's treatment of the Jews, fear of Germany's own atomic bomb program, and by the interesting scientific and logistics problems that, be, that went into building an atomic bomb. He worked for roughly three years as director of the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos, effectively liaising between the military and the scientists on the project, up until the point where the first Trinity, uh, the Trinity test took place, which was the first atomic explosion. Oppenheimer is perhaps most famous for what he is reported to have said immediately after the explosion. I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I am few people laughed, few people cried, most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. His brother Frank, in the documentary The Day After Trinity, said that Robert had instead exclaimed, it worked. Perhaps he said one thing and he thought another, but regardless, it's clear that Robert was deeply moved by the ramifications of the explosion. It's interesting to look at what he meant by this quote from the Bhagavad Gita, because it's not as clear cut as it may seem. Oppenheimer was not a Hindu, but he did turn to Hinduism in this quote. He'd read the Bhagavad Gita in the original Sanskrit, and the translation may have some problems. The quotation does not mean that Oppenheimer felt all powerful or that he felt responsible for destroying the world. The Bhagavad Gita focuses on a dialogue between a great warrior prince called Arjuna and the charioteer, Lord Krishna, who is an incarnation of the god Vishnu. Arjuna faced an army combining many of his friends and relatives. He didn't want to fight these people. Krishna teaches Arjuna of a higher philosophy called Dharma, that requires Arjuna to carry out his duties as a warrior, regardless of his personal concerns, and puts the responsibility for those actions onto the god himself. In the passage quoted by Oppenheimer, Arjuna is asked, has asked Krishna to reveal his universal form. This translation, the translation of Krishna's words, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds, is an interesting interpretation of the Sanskrit. The literal translation is, now I have become the world destroyer, the world destroying time, which is a reference to the Hindu belief that Vishnu will herald the end of the world. The meaning is somewhat simpler to understand, I think, with this translation. Regardless of what Arjuna does, everything is in the hands of the divine. Krishna, not Arjuna, will determine who lives and who dies, and Arjuna should neither mourn nor rejoice over the, what fate has in store. Now, the warrior prince was able to find satisfaction in this and complete his duty. But Oppenheimer, by all evidence, is unable to accept this appeal to a higher authority as a revocation of his own responsibility for his actions. The concept of what he and the scientists at Los Alamos had done was dharma was unsatisfying, perhaps because Oppenheimer did not believe in the concept of an eternal, undying soul. This perspective would be confirmed in later years at Nuremberg, when the fact of following superior orders did not absolve Nazis of their own responsibility during the war. Knowing that superior orders would be a defense that was used, the Nuremberg Council created a set of principles. And principle four states that the fact that a person acted pursuant to, order of, to an order of his government or of a superior does not resolve, relieve him of responsibility under international law. 
provided a moral choice is in fact possible to him. And in fact, German military law itself, since 1872, said that while a superior is solely responsible for his order, the subordinate is to be punished for his participation if he either transgressed the order on his own account or if the order is criminal. Even more recently, a software engineer for Volkswagen was sentenced to 40 months in prison and a $200,000 fine in 2007 for being complicit in a project to defraud the federal government and violate the Clean Air Act. In 2015, the CEO of Volkswagen America put the blame for these actions on engineers, saying, this was not a corporate decision. From my point of view, and to the best of my knowledge today, this was a, this was a couple of software engineers who'd put this in for whatever reasons. Despite this, the CEO was able to explain in detail how the defeat devices worked. Oppenheimer would later reject the concept that dogma, which is related to dharma, in, uh, in science. There must be no barriers to freedom of inquiry. There's no place for dogma in science. The scientist is free and must be free to ask any question, to doubt any assertion, to seek for any evidence, to correct any errors. Our political life is also predicated on openness. We know that the one way to avoid errors is to detect it, and the only way to detect it will be to be free to inquire. And we know that as long as men are free to ask what they must, free to say what they think, free to think what they will, freedom can never be lost, and science can never regress. Thus, dogmatism and dharma are incompatible with Oppenheimer's viewpoint on the duties of the scientists of the world and his ethical perspective on the responsibility for his actions. Oppenheimer had joined the Manhattan Project at a time when Germany was developing its own bomb program. But by now, Hitler had committed suicide, and Germany had surrendered. While Oppenheimer definitely did not believe at this point that the bomb should not be used, nor was he swayed that it shouldn't, by some of the petitions of the scientists at the Manhattan Project, that it shouldn't be used on Japan. Surely, one of his prime motivations being gone, in that Germany was no longer around to be the enemy that drove this, was beginning to sow a seed of doubt in Oppenheimer's mind. Couple this with the fact that Japan did not have a credi credible bomb program, and that they were already crippled. They couldn't feel a, field a naval offensive at this point. The Japanese were a largely defeated enemy on the verge of surrender, and were only posturing for continuation of the war, while they secretly position, petitioned the USSR to help them negotiate for better terms of surrender. Robert wasn't aware of it at this point, but Washington had intercepted and decoded messages from Japan indicating that the Japanese government understood that the war was over and was seeking acceptable surrender terms. They would likely have surrendered within the same time period whether or not the bomb was used. Nonetheless, Oppenheimer not only petitioned against the use of the atomic, did not pet petition against the use of the atomic bombs, but he helped to select appropriate targets. On the 6th of August, 1945, the United States of America dropped an atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Three days later, on the 9th of August, it dropped an atomic bomb on the city of Nagasaki. In October 25th of 1945, President Harry S. Truman received Oppenheimer in the Oval Office. The physicist had requested the meeting in an effort to persuade the president to support international control over nuclear weapons. Truman disarmed Oppenheimer by asking when, he thought, when the latter thought that the Russians would have a nuclear weapon. Oppenheimer said that he did not know. But Truman interjected, never. Sensing a lack of urgency in the United States leader, and perhaps a little overwhelmed at their first meeting, he's in the Oval Office, Oppenheimer confided, Mr. President, I feel I have blood on my hands. The remark infuriated Truman, who bluntly replied that the blood is on my hands, let me worry about that, and smoothly ejected the physicist, and instructed Secretary of State Dean Ackeson to never bring that son of a bitch into the office ever again. Oppenheimer meant that he wore the blood of future casualties of nuclear war, not the blood of the enemy. The crybaby scientist, as Truman later dismissed, cared not so much for the enemy in this war, who he felt were the collateral damage of a war that they had brought on themselves, but for the Western victims, the allies, who would be victims to, in a future nuclear Armageddon. Robert's remark alluded to his responsibility for the death of millions of individuals in some distant apocalypse, would be traced, which would be traced to the two nuclear bombs, nicknamed Little Boy and Fat Man. Hiroshima and Nagasaki served as terrible, examples of what a bomb might do. 
but he did not think of them as avoidable tragedies in their own right. He quickly cast forward as though he dared not look back to a world where he dreamed global control on nuclear weapons would entrench a lasting peace. Robert Oppenheimer was now a celebrity, his name and image familiar to millions of Americans. He was the Neil deGrasse Tyson, the Carl Sagan, the Stephen Hawking of his time. The only scientist more famous was Albert Einstein. Robert soon began to take advantage of this public attention to bring his private broodings into the light. We've made a thing, a most terrible weapon, he told an audience of the American Philosophical Society, that has altered abruptly and profoundly the nature of the world, a thing that by all standards of the world we grew up in is an evil thing. And so by doing, we have raised again the question of whether science is good for man. The Hiroshima bomb was used against an essentially defeated enemy. It's a weapon for aggressors, and the elements of surprise and terror are intrinsic to it, as are the fissionable nuclei. Oppenheimer did throw himself into the effort to create an authority to control nuclear weapons. In early 1946, he, donated the, he dominated the drafting of the Akison Lilienthal Report, better known as, or officially known as the Report on International Control on Atomic Energy, an ambitious blueprint for international control through a creation of an atomic development authority that would own all uranium, mines, atomic power plants, and laboratories. Essentially, all countries would cede that small amount of sovereignty in exchange for a safer world. Even the hard-headed Ackeson, the Secretary of State from before, called this a brilliant to profound document. Oppenheimer deliberately framed the proposal so as to assuage Soviet fears. But Truman dashed all hopes of choosing, by choosing a virulently anti-Soviet financier, Bernard Baruch, to report to present his own revised version of the plan to the United Nations sabotaging the last real chance for forestalling an arms race. Though he continued to lobby in, for some sort of international control over atomic weapons, energy, research, and resources, Oppenheimer was greatly depressed at the lack of success and concluded that the Atomic Energy Commission, which was the organization that replaced the Atomic Development Authority, would have a principal job of providing atomic weapons and good atomic weapons and many atomic weapons. The Cold War had arrived. And with it, the stockpiling of atomic weapons both by the United States and eventually by the USSR. In 47, Oppenheimer accepted a position as the director for the Institute of Advanced Studies at Princeton. He sought to do for the Institute what he had done for Berkeley in the 30s, which is to turn it into a premier center for theoretical physics. He hoped to rekindle some of the work that had been sidetracked when the war broke out and all physics focused on either radar or the atomic bomb. He also expanded the institute to accept not only the physicists, such as Freeman Dyson and Albert Einstein, but also humanists, such as T.S. Eliot, Hunter Thompson, and Arthur Toynbee, Arnold Toynbee. He worked as the director of the institute for most of the rest of his life, trying to foster good in the fellows there through collaboration and the resources that he could provide in that role. Throughout his long history of service to the United States government, there had been growing suspicion among influential people such as FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, Senator Joseph McCarthy, physicist Edward Teller, who was the father of the atomic bomb, which Oppenheimer had vehemently opposed the research and development of, and Louis L. Strauss, chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission. If you're not familiar with the McCarthy era, era it was defined by a Republican charge to rid the government of subversives who had supposedly infiltrated the system. In December of 1953, Oppenheimer fell victim to McCarthyism when Strauss convinced President Eisenhower to have Oppenheimer's security clearance suspended and a hearing convened to determine whether it should be reinstated. Among over 20 charges, which included Oppenheimer's dealings with, in his youth with communists, which I'll remind you was more or less just the American left at that point, and the delaying of naming of Soviet agents and opposing the building of the hydrogen bomb and of being a Soviet spy, None of these were true, but the hearing destroyed Oppenheimer. Though he did not find any evidence of treason, Robert would never again have a security clearance, and his work with the government was effectively ended. Years later, at Oppenheimer's funeral, the lone dissenting vote at the hearing, Henry DeWolf Smith, now a congressman, expressed regret at this treatment. Such a wrong can never be righted. Such a blotch on our history can never be erased. 
Movements like the McCarthy area commun communist hunts, or today's fake news, the media is the enemy of the people, drain the swamp rhetoric, should be, focused, should be viewed with a critical eye and challenged. We can flex our muscles as technologists to, build technology, to not build technologies that would be used for things like identifying and monitoring immigrants, or separating families as they enter the country seeking legal asylum. What I'm getting at here is that even though I did something bad, and even though Oppenheimer did something bad, we can try to atone for it. Yeah, we, ideally we would never have done these things in the first place. But we did. So we tried to redeem ourselves in some way. There are good examples of the tech industry doing this in just the past year. Recently, tens of thousands of Google employees staged a walkout, demanding an end to the sexual harassment, discrimination, and systematic racism that fueled the destructive culture in tech. They wanted to end forced arbitration and in sexual harassment cases, and they wanted pay transparency to ensure that women and minorities did not continue to be underpaid and underpromoted relative to their white and male peers. Participating in this type of protest, particularly when you're in the majority, the unaffected group, is a great way to put some good back into the world. This past summer, I co-signed a letter to CEO Mark Benioff with more than 650 colleagues at Salesforce, asking the company to re-examine its business dealings with all contracts, but specifically calling out customs and border protection. We cannot cede responsibility for the use of the technology that we create, they read, particularly when we have reason to believe that it's being used to aid practices so irreconcilable to our values. Earlier in 2018, more than 3,000 Google employees signed a similar letter that asked that government, that company, to end its involvement building AI meant to assist surveillance by drones, promoting the company, prompting the company to end that contract with the Department of Defense. These letters show that tech employees are aware of the ethical responsibilities and moral repercussions that we have when we build and sell software. Some responsibility for how the software that we build is ultimately lies with us. I was proud to add my voice to that Salesforce letter, and I helped to bring it to the attention of others at Heroku so that they could also sign if they, if they agreed. Like Oppenheimer, when we create negative consequences, we can work to mitigate them. It may not cancel out what you've done. People may work against you. You might suffer even more for trying to balance the scales. But in the end, Hopefully you'll be remembered well for trying to do the right thing. Thank you.